Welcome to the Future of Sharing, the series where we look hard at how can we make the sharing economy work for everyone. I'm Pete Leiden, I'm the founder of reInvent, and I am here in Philadelphia at the Democratic National Convention, the crossroads of a lot of mayors, a lot of people in politics, a lot of people running cities. And with me today, I have Stephen Yarwood. Stephen is the former Lord Mayor of Adelaide, Australia. He's probably come the furthest of any delegate, or you're not a delegate, but any, any person to this convention. So we're really happy to have you here. Absolutely, thanks. I'm obligated to say g'day. <laughs> Fair enough and good. So for those who might not be familiar with Australia, like you, uh, give us a little context of what you were doing and where. How did that all work? So Adelaide's a fascinating uh, modern social experiment established as an act of Westminster in uh, the UK Parliament to uh, balance land, financial capital and human labour. So there are actually no convicts where I come from. Uh, it was a, a consciously planned city uh, established in 1836. Uh, today it's one and a half million people, uh, right in the middle southern port portion of Australia, on the edge of the second biggest desert in the world. Uh, and it's world famous for things like uh, wine uh, and arts and culture. It's a lovely destination. Uh, and it's a boutique Europe European style Australian city. And you were the Lord Mayor from when? when, when? Uh, so I uh, worked in local government, got sick and tired of giving good advice to elected members I didn't think understood the future, uh, became a councillor in uh, 2006, uh, became the Lord Mayor in 2010, uh, was elected as the youngest Lord Mayor of any Australian city, capital city in history at the time. Uh, the bookies had me at 15 to uh, 1 odds of, of winning the election uh, and uh, I finished in 2014. Awesome. And now what are you doing now? You're kind of building off your knowledge of cities and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so when I started my town planning degree 25 years ago and I was learning about Le Corbusier and Ebenezer Howard, uh, as well as having an Adelaide 2020 vision project happening uh, in, in the region itself, I was inspired about future cities. So I've always followed this notion of transformative change around cities and been convinced that technology was going to drive uh, not only change, but create a new operating system for cities. Uh, and so I uh, finally realised my dream uh, and I started my own consultancy called City 2050 and trading as an urban futurist. Every city in the world will do a 2050 plan uh, and I believe in the transformation of cities. Uh, and it's a privilege to be working with cities around Australia, New Zealand, uh, Middle East and Asia uh, to help them think uh, much more innovatively around what cities can do in the short, medium and long term not only talk about it, but help them un undertake that change. Interesting. Well, we'll get to that in a second here. Let's go back to you as Lord Mayor. When did you first kind of get introduced to the sharing economy and what did you start thinking about it when it started to impact your city? Well, it's interesting. I don't necessarily think that the share economy has really impacted on city governance and policy yet. In fact, I think there's a vacuum that cities are yet to actually catch up with. Uh, I think it's being driven by entrepreneurs, it's being driven by uh, companies, but most importantly it's been driven by communities. Uh, and so I'm really inspired by that. Uh, so my first exposure was actually staying at an Airbnb in Penang, uh, mm -hmm. where I was able to stay in a uh, regenerated old um, house in the middle of the heritage area of uh, Georgetown in Penang, which is a sister city of the city of Adelaide. Uh, I've also subsequently stayed in accommodation in, um, in Norway, in remote New Zealand, uh, all through Australia and, uh, uh, and uh, aware of the fact I'm uh, interested in the cycling industry uh, and I've spoken to the people at Spin Lister who are now creating that uh, and of course uh, I'm following the trajectory of Uber. But I would say it's been more my interest in innovation in cities than it was my role of Lord Mayor that exposed me to the share economy. Well, no, I understand, though, that you are a host now. Tell, tell us a little bit about how you got yeah. involved in, in actually being a host. That's interesting. So my daughter uh, turned 21 just the other day, and she uh, left. She was staying out the back uh, of our house, which is connected but not integrated to our house, uh, in the loft above our double garage. She had her own bathroom, etc. And she went to go and study in Edinburgh in Scotland. And so we had this big space. And I really wanted to um, you know, immerse myself in the share economy uh, because I'm interested in it. Uh, I also wanted to run a business off an app 
Uh, and uh, I'd just finished being Lord Mayor. I had an empty room, had a bit of time on my hands to establish it. Uh, and my wife and I always like to keep busy. So we started uh, what has become Adelaide's probably most famous Airbnb. It was reported in the newspaper as Mayor B&B, which is uh, not, not to be surprised. Um, it's received um, uh, a lot of criticism from conservative sector, who, who the Hotels Association, uh, received a tremendous amount of media, and it's been profoundly successful. Uh, we've uh, had an occupancy rate of about 75%. Uh, we've had people from uh, China, Singapore, all through Europe, North America, New Zealand, all around Australia. Uh, we've made some friends. Uh, we've had all great experiences. Uh, and it's been a little bit of pocket money to actually um, you know, help us uh, pay off the mortgage, uh, start up my own consultancy. Uh, and uh, now, in particular, it's changed from just the loft to re-engineering our house. Um, I travel a tremendous amount. Uh, so when I was at the World City Summit in Singapore, I took my family and we rented an Airbnb in Singapore, which was somebody's home. Uh, we also rented out our entire house in Adelaide for that week. And the income we generated from that actually paid for our accommodation in Singapore. So it was a very uh, innovative way of, of you know, sharing the love, I guess, as well as financing uh, our own travels that will continue to do more and more because we're empowered and, and able to do so. Interesting. So you've got kind of two hats. You've kind of been running a city and you've also been experiencing firsthand the sharing economy. So for people who um, you know, are running other cities, and which is kind of the folks that will be kind of tuning into this, or at least interested in the future of cities, um, just from your point of view, what, what's, what's good about the sharing economy that you think is, a, is, is good? And we'll, we'll talk about issues as well, but sure. let's kind of lay out to to, to the folks who are just trying to wrap their heads around it, what, what's the good side of it? What, why do well, people do it? What's interesting about it? Why, why do you think it's good for cities? Yeah, look, on balance, I'm very excited about the share economy. Uh, and it's not really a conversation about today. Uh, and it's not just Airbnb or Uber. Um, this is about, um, we're in a stage that was almost like the Model T Ford, where Henry Ford invented the production line and we saw cars transform how cities worked. Uh, we also saw engineering and manufacturing uh, profoundly transformed in terms of how we went around actually creating products. Uh, and so I think, as a futurist, um, I think of the long now. And so I think what's happening today is the start of a rewriting of an entire new operating system of cities. Um, so every city in the world has huge amounts of unused assets, empty buildings, um, you know, roads that aren't used to capacity, um, you know, a whole range of things. Um, in particular, heritage buildings. So every city in the world faces challenges around how they use upper storey buildings and, and old infrastructure uh, in, in their cities, often in their downtown cores, uh, but also in neighbourhoods that need regeneration. Uh, and so I see a very significant change underway um, that ultimately I would think of as mapping out the, the resource infrastructure and, uh, and networks of communities. Um, so I, I'd be very cautious about wanting to over-regulate um, Airbnb or Uber or whoever it is, because it's not just about them. What you're doing is undermining the trajectory of the share economy, which is also about the potential to share lawnmowers in neighbourhoods, about uh, sharing electric drills, um, around providing resources for communities who can't afford to own things. Um, it's around uh, the future of transport. Uh, it's around the future of travel and connecting communities in unique ways. Uh, whether it's um, people like you and I or the listeners taking people on tours of their city uh, or, or connecting people to provide meals for each other, whether it's as tourists or as a social service. Uh, we're about to see the transformation of big government and small community to small government and big community where the government needs to support the mapping of these neural networks and the creation of opportunities uh, through this process. Uh, so I'm really kind of excited about not just Airbnb and Uber and uh, all the companies we hear about today. I'm excited about the potential 
Um, I, I spend a fair bit of time in India, for example, who's, which is a c country now that is pursuing smart cities agenda. Um, and frankly, India is already one of the great share economies of today. Uh, but if they don't become a share economy in the 21st century, uh, the whole planet is going to start to really suffer uh, in terms of research shortages and uh, resource shortages and a whole range of other things. Um, this is one of the truly unique opportunities to use humanity's resources profoundly more efficiently um, and be more sustainable, uh, more livable and, and more productive as, as, as a culture. So just to the end there, you, you finally used the word sustainable, I was waiting for that, but how much of this is driven by your kind of worries about climate change and research, uh, resource, uh, is the sharing about yep. that? How much of it is that as well as, as what you were describing? Yeah, uh, so I'm, uh, as well as having postgraduate uh, planning qualifications, I've got postgraduate environmental studies qualifications, uh, and I'm genuinely concerned around the trajectory of climate change, uh, resource management, uh, and, and also just how uh, humans you know, interact with the environment just generally. You only have to go to places like India to actually start to see what 1.25 billion people can do to have an impact on, on waterways, on agriculture, etc. Um, but I'm always conscious of not overselling that mm -hmm. uh, because I think, uh, for me, people want solutions in their lives they don't want to be told what to do. Uh, and so I see the share economy as a great opportunity to provide people with solutions in ways that then they don't necessarily realise that they're not sort of feeding more inappropriate economic development, more sort of uh, more capitalism, uh, greater growth for the growth's sake. Uh, and it's also the sustainability on so many different levels. Um, it is climate change. It is about walkable communities. It is about knowing how to get a, a bicycle in the local community, um, but it's also about sustainable economies. So it's about, uh, you know, I understand through Airbnb research that there's a high proportion of people who don't stay in traditional tourist areas, who stay in suburban areas. They're putting their money back into the local economy by renting off that person, but they're also then spending their money at local supermarkets uh, at local restaurants uh, and local service providers that don't normally capture that. Uh, and that money gets circulated much more efficiently into the local economy, um, which is sustainability in terms of the local economy. But it's actually sustainability just quite literally in terms of how people spend their money, where the resources are created. You know, you spend your money in a large conglomerate supermarket chain, and that avocado probably came from Brazil. Uh, whereas you spend it from a, a local shop and it's much more likely to be sourced locally. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an infinitely complex um, social, environmental, and I think the key for me is productivity. You know, I think if we can be more productive, we can be better for the environment. And so looking at the productivity of the share economy feeds then naturally into the sustainability uh, of the sh share economy as well. Well, now, pr okay, explain that to folks. Again, we're, we're, we're talking to folks. Um, explain the productivity piece about, about how the share economy <coughs> productivity. Sure. That, that's, so um, that's not commonly discussed. No, absolutely. Um, um, uh, from an uh, from an Australian perspective, I'll start again. From a, an Australian perspective, uh, we have developed a national urban policy around livability and. Um, five of uh, uh, Australian cities are in the top ten most livable cities in the world, according mm. to The Economist. Um, and sustainability, which I think speaks for itself. Uh, but the productivity piece is really about how cities work. Uh, a great example is that um, most cities lose billions of dollars of lost economic productivity of people literally sitting in traffic jams. Mm. And, uh, and so the productivity it then is directly linked in that case, as a metaphor, to sustainability. If someone's in a uh, traffic jam, uh, they're consuming greater resources. Uh, they're also then feeding, uh, providing a feedback loop of, uh, of actually uh, assuming that driving is the right way to go, um, that we need to create more highways, uh, and we get into this cycle of, of cities that um, then actually feed onto obesity, onto feeding, onto people travelling further from home, uh, etc. So the idea then of, of 
getting the share economy where you're, you're moving into local neighbourhoods that are probably more likely got access to public transport, uh, that actually um, uh, purchase local produce, etc., and, and creating those local economies and those, those networks um, are about making cities much more efficient. So we're starting to move from a city having one big sewage treatment plant, one big energy plant, uh, one big water plant, um, and, and one big hospital to having a cell nature, or, the, or they call it the circular economy, uh, where uh, local neighbourhoods will have solar panels on their roof, they'll have water capture, they'll have community gardens, uh, they'll have a local park, they'll have their local markets. Um, we, in my community, each year do a gar annual garage sale, and so it's about uh, right. re rotating our stock. You know, my, um, my next door neighbour has a son that's three years older than my son, and she, she's regularly purchasing bicycles and clothes, etc., off me for, um, you know, for not much more than I paid for them, but it's, it works for everyone. Um, so the real key to the future of cities, and, and the share economy is a big part of it, is, is making cities more productive, uh, giving people access to the resources they need, um, whether it's accommodation, um, and in my Airbnb, we've had uh, women who have come from domestic violence approach us, for example. Uh, we've had people, this is a great... What, what do you mean by that? I mean, a oh, well, local person that yeah, needs to get away from yeah, somebody? Yeah, absolutely. A local woman who's looking for emergency accommodation. Um, and that, you know, that's very sad, but I, and unfortunately, it is a very unfortunate fact of life that something that we're all tr working very hard to get rid of. Um, but Airbnb isn't just about tourism accommodation. Uh, there are people who have moved into our place for a couple of weeks because they're about to move overseas and they've sold their house. Uh, we've had people who have come through, and this is a great Australian story, they didn't end up staying but they came from northern Australia through Adelaide and they couldn't stay in a hotel because they were nursing two baby joeys. Now, to those Wait, people... Who, with it. They're baby kangaroos. <laughs> uh, so, they, you know, and I could say that happens every day. <laughs> But I think most people perpetuate would, the Australian. Yeah, yes. but okay. but we had that inquiry just a week ago, for example. So you know, there's a whole range of elements to the share economy that allow it to go outside of the traditional boundaries of going to a shop and having to buy something because you think you need it, or you know, you traditionally uh, a household would have it, versus being able to access it from your your net, uh, next door neighbour. Uh, or in the case where I'm renting a place here in Philadelphia a few days, uh, I'm living in somebody's home. And what's good about that? Just tell me, what, what do you like oh, about as my, opposed to a hotel here? Uh, so I, uh, in the last week I've stayed in somebody's home in um, uh, Singapore, Melbourne and Philadelphia. And uh, it's a much more intimate experience because there's no other place like the place I'm staying in. So you're not staying in a generic, um, you know, rack and pack and stack them. Uh, there's no one at the front counter who is sort of treating you just like, you know, someone who, you know, is is just a regular Joe. Um, uh, you know, I was welcomed by the CEO of the company uh, yes last night when I arrived, the the owner of the home, uh, and it's just you know, if someone lives in that house, you know that they're going to have, um, you know, good products. Uh, that they're probably going to have a soda stream if you want um, soda water, uh, that the coffee is going to be good, that the, the bed's going to be good, that the sheets and pillows are going to be of high quality. And they take pride, people take pride in their own home. Uh, and it, it also, when you travel as much as I do, it feels homely. Uh, but an even better example for me, and one that I talk about a lot in my keynote speaking, is uh, that at the moment there's a huge issue with um, dairy farmers in Australia and New Zealand. And so the global conglomerates are selling, having a price war on milk. Uh, and they've been able to just tell the dairy farmers that uh, the price is dropping by 25% and they've got no choice. And that now is actually pretty much on what they make, it costs for them to make it. Um, but the idea of um, getting people from Australia or New Zealand to take their families on a holiday to a dairy farm and empower New Zealand farmers to use Airbnb uh, to, and I've been, I took my son to a farm in New Zealand through Airbnb. He was able to, you know, feed the sheep, uh, walk through the paddocks, uh, ride a horse. We didn't go to a dairy farm, 
Uh, but of course, if you have been to the Southern Hemisphere, you can also see the entire Milky Way at night time. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you have a glass with the owner of the company. Um, you're the only person, so there's not other people's kids running up and down the hallway. Mm -hmm. um, and when you wake up, you stretch out your arms out on the balcony and first thing in the morning to complete silence and the sound of birds singing. And uh, <laughs> you can't get that in a generic hotel environment uh, yeah, and you're also supporting rural Australia or, or rural uh, New Zealand in a time when um, farmers are doing it really tough. Okay, so there's a totally, you, you're making a very convincing case about the positive things. Now that said, as a mayor, you understand there's all these different interests and there's all different kind of folks. I mean, so there have been issues that have emerged around the sharing economy and with your mayor's hat on and your future's hat on a little bit. Um, Talk about the issues that are coming up as any transition to a new issue, a new kind of system works. Absolutely, no question there are issues, and I, don't, I think it's really important that we don't hide from those, and that we actually proactively engage in those. Uh, so, um, you know, one example I, I, you know, I know is that people are now purchasing multiple properties. Uh, even people are renting multiple properties and then running them as an Airbnb, uh, for example. Now, it's interesting. I've got multiple theories. If you're in a regional part of Australia where you want to promote development and you're not necessarily going to attract, attract a big chain hotel to your community, the idea of actually doing that can promote development in your city in a sustainable way. You know, if you know, if a developer wants to get a 40 apartment uh, hotel across, uh, um, a building across the line, and he's only sold 20, well, if someone could take up 10 of those and run them as an Airbnb, you've probably got that development across the line. Uh, and if there are already hotels, you're probably providing housing diversity in the community as well. Um, but in a city, in a city that's a highly uh, touristed, visited area, let's just say Sydney, Melbourne, or the Gold Coast, for example, uh, where um, people are now purchasing multiple properties, it is affecting the economics of that city and uh, the affordability of renting and purchasing properties, uh, which isn't just Airbnb. It's actually, you know, um, it's actually the Middle East, you know, purchasing the properties. It's 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 wealthy people from all around the world realizing that Australia is absolutely drop dead gorgeous and, and and Sydney now has is one of the sort of top five most expensive cities in the world to purchase property. That's not just Airbnb. But it is another element to that and, and that element is because of the desirability of the destination. Um, there's a whole range of concerns that people have around the share economy in terms of safety and regulation. Uh, you know the taxi industry and, and Uber is another good example. Uh, and you know is it safe? Um, I, I personally aspire to self-regulation. I think that we've gone overboard and it means that uh, traditional taxis and traditional hotels are outside of the, uh, the affordability of young people, for example, uh, and that we, this has been a really good opportunity for a serious reality check where not everyone can afford a, a hotel. Uh, and if, that, if we're then push, pushing them into communal accommodation, uh, when they could potentially you know, go through an Airbnb and share with two or three people, their friends, in, in accommodation that m might not be as expensive because it's not over-regulated. I think there's some benefits um, there as well. Oh, I don't subscribe to safeties around, uh, issues around uh, fire safety, etc. I mentioned my teenage daughter lived in the loft. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, it was, you know, if you think that Airbnb visitors need you know, fire safety regulation, we should really be regulating teenage daughters <laughs> a long time before we regulate visitors, mm -hmm. uh, etc. cetera. Um, and so there, there are some of the issues. I think- what, what, what about the, the ride sharing? Because you you've, you've been talking quite a bit about home sharing. The ride sharing, because that's a, been a kind of a flashpoint in a, in a lot of cities, even more so than the housing stuff. Give yeah. me a few thoughts on, on, on the pros and cons of how to figure that sure. out, those yeah. issues out. Uh, well, once again, I, ride sharing is a, is a really good example of uh, early, early transition of something quite profound. So um, I'm not a believer in driverless cars. Um, because, you are not a believer. Well, because we used to call them horseless carriages, and now we're calling them driverless cars, which is, and assuming that a horseless carriage behaves like a horse and carriage, 
when the car completely redefined how cities work. Yeah. If we are applying car mentality to something that is a completely different beast, an autonomous vehicle, which isn't a car. So many urbanists are now saying, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it is a duck. Um, and they're saying that autonomous vehicles, they call them driverless cars, um, are somehow uh, bad. I don't believe that's the case. I think autonomous vehicles, and this is where we go into ride sharing, uh, make no mistake, the current Uber is literally the Adam and Eve of a global transformation of transport patterns um, that will see a tipping point of cities in the next 10 years. Just as the vehicle defines cities in the 21st century, what's happening in this space now is going to completely rewrite the urban operating system of the 21st century. And whilst engineers and Google and, and Tesla talk about autonomous vehicles, I still think there's a gap in the conversation of what that actually physically means for how cities are going to work. And you combined um, autonomous vehicles with ride share and also artificial intelligence, which is really going to sort of change um, how people move and, and connect. Uh, and I think we're going to see some really profound changes. Um, I've used Uber Pool uh, in Singapore, uh, and I can't help but wonder whether cars are going to become autonomous vehicles, especially a form of public transport, uh, and drive a completely different sort of pattern. Uh, my, I still think that we're going to need rail, light rail, public transport, and that the autonomous vehicle will very much be a uh, the, a last mile proposition that connects people from the station to their home. Uh, but people aren't going to own cars. Uh, and goes to the Airbnb, uh, going back to that, increasingly less people are going to own homes as well. So an Airbnb is great for two, two, two days through to how many months you want to stay. Um, but that price will, is a curve. Um, and it's the same with a car. Um, you know, the, the cost of getting from A to B um, is going to be so much cheaper that people aren't going to want to own a car, I don't want to clean it. I saw a gentleman who got won a BMW in Delhi and I couldn't help but wonder who the hell wants to own a BMW <laughs> in Delhi <laughs> when you've got to clean it, insure it, yeah, yeah, etc. Uh, whereas, you know, the freedom of being able to walk out of a door, jump in a vehicle, get to where you're going, pay for the kilometres, not have to park, not have to drive around the block, not have to clean it, to sit in the back and actually have a conversation with your child, there's a whole range of social, environmental and economic factors. Um, and so uh, the, sh the ride share is a whole different thing because I actually think it is going to be the first of the share economy that really actually brings in sort of robotics, artificial intelligence, and a change in society very dramatically that will see cities work in completely different ways. When 30% of all of our cities are allocated to vehicles, yet an autonomous vehicle could mean that um, the lane of a car could be reduced because it hasn't got a human error. Traffic lights will probably go within about 30 years hmm. because um, the sensors will just understand how to communicate, yeah. They're not going to be necessary. Um, parking lots will completely disappear uh, and be replaced by housing. And most parking lots are next to shopping centres or, or in the downtown. You're going to see more people spending more time in high quality urban spaces. And the vehicles won't actually choose to go into those spaces because the artificial intelligence will be run, run, running an algorithm that says it's mathematically quicker to go around than through. Mm -hmm. And people will start to reclaim city centres. You can see I could talk about this for a while. Yeah, no, 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 I love this. In fact, this is kind of, but now again, for folks that are just trying to wrap their head in the, around the, the sharing economy, um, when you lay out that kind of vision, or we're talking how many decades, or how, how, do you, how does that play out? Okay, um, so your, uh, our, our watches or our phones will be smarter than us yeah, around. Now, this is all prediction stuff. Yeah, this totally is all good. based on leading research and, and the work that's being done out of, you know, um, uh, Google, uh, not to mention Elon Musk now is doing an open AI 
uh, a session, uh, but your watches, our phones, will probably be smarter than us around 2030 to 2040. So, um, you know, that's talking 15, 15 20 years away, uh, which is in our lifetime. It's in pretty much everyone's lifetime, you know, uh, unless you're in your sort of 80s. And uh, so this is going to happen quite rapidly now. Artificial intelligence is embedded in what we're doing. In terms of the autonomous vehicle, which is directly correlated, make no mistake about it to what Uber is doing, you know, you're talking about a company that has partnerships with car manufacturers around it uh, and the leadership of Uber has announced that they are building a company that will have no drivers. Yep. Uh, and so, um, and autonomous vehicles, they're saying sort of probably 75% saturation by about 2040 uh, as well. Uh, so we're starting to see this become, you know, yes, it's futuristic, uh, but then so was the mobile phone about 15 years ago and the penetration of the smartphone um, has been incredible, let alone the, the penetration of Pokemon Go in the last two weeks. <laughs> and that is what we're starting to see in terms of rapid acceleration uh, of, of people's willingness to uptake technology and embrace it if they see a, a cost benefit uh, and a livability benefit. And, uh, and hopefully, in turn, that then increases productivity and really starts to tackle, tackle some of those key sustainability issues that we're facing. So it's fascinating. So, so you got to kind of, what's interesting is this is one of the first interviews we've done in this series where you literally are uh, putting the sharing economy as a, basically a transitional, I mean, I don't want to put words in your space, but in your mouth, but it feels to me like you're saying, look, there's this bigger sweep of the transition of what cities are going through and society's going through, the economy's going through. The sharing economy is an early field that's working some of this early issues out. Yep. But it is not the end game, it's actually this kind of transitional game. Is that safe to say? You're yeah, look, I, I think so. Uh, I've been very interested in how cities have transformed and I've s studied and investigated a number of cities. Melbourne uh, transformed. Uh, New York went through a really rapid transformation process really over the last sort of 15 to 20 years. Uh, and certainly the work recently that Michael Bloomberg did around transport is yet another really good example in, in New York of transformation. Um, Copenhagen is a city that was completely congested with cars just 20, 30 years ago and now it's a, a bicycle mecca. And so I think the old adage is people say that some things never change, but you know, I believe in the transformation of cities. And the car really did transform cities in the 20th century. And I've been following how technology is going to transform cities this century for a long time, and finally start to see some of this, this taking hold. Now, what I think is key around the share economy is if cities are, if, if artificial intelligence is about seeing patterns and making uh, complex decisions based on sophisticated patterns, um, cities are really just patterns and the patterns are created by the nodes and those nodes are things called people. And we are now all geospatial uh, people because of the smartphones we, we carry on us. And so the share economy is really about mapping completely new, sophisticated neural networks that will actually start to see spatial patterns uh, and how people uh, use resources, which is really what urban planning is all about, um, used in completely new and unique ways. And ultimately in a real time that will actually take the art of urban planning out uh, and, and overlay it with a much more sophisticated science. Uh, and I guess hmm. that's what I'm really excited about. Totally interesting. So part of this series also is introducing people who run cities in all over the country, the America, the world, different places, to trying to really s get oriented and get kind of figure it out and start to go forward into get it. Get jiggy with it. Get jiggy with it. There you yeah. go. Um, so, and having been, I don't know, Lord Mayor there and understanding how you run cities, what, what are some ways you'd start to, what kind of advice would you be given to 
comparable mayors mm -hmm. um, who are starting to wrap their heads around this, or people running cities, city sure. managers. You, you tell me. Just give give some thoughts of how how would you what would you be advising? Here we are in 2016. Sure. Going well, forward. and I guess this is what I do do today. So oh, okay, as, okay. as a practicing urban futurist, um, that's what I do. Uh, and so at the moment, I'm uh, one of the key things that I do is uh, training and development with staff. Uh, and also training and development with the mayor and the elected members uh, and try to get everyone on the same plane to actually understand uh, what's about to come. Uh, so what, what would I do? Uh, first and foremost, I think it is for me around the training and development because I think a lot of the um, cities, the, a lot of the people running our cities, states and nations, if I can be a little bit cheeky and maybe a little bit bold, tend to sort of be in their 50s and 60s and um, have, are very important people, and so have an executive assistant that organises their flights, their diary, um, answers all their emails, etc. And so they haven't actually been brought up with a digital literacy hmm. and an ongoing ability to adapt and evolve. And uh, so, you know, as Lord Mayor, I drove my staff to meetings in my electric car, and it wasn't because I, you know, well, it was because I really enjoyed driving the electric car, but it was also about understanding how the electric car works and inter interacts with the city, and it was also about leadership. Uh, and so I work with, uh, so I would really encourage um, city leaders to get their head around it. Very, so we shouldn't make the assumption that they understand it. Um, and whilst you know, there's always going to be a role for people like you and me, because you know, people have. Some mayors have never even heard of Airbnb uh, or, or even understand the share economy. And, and so I think it really starts with educating people. In terms of what, what do we educate them about, firstly it's about getting them to actually understand the very basics of the values and principles and how it works. Uh, because I think uh, you know, many of them, as I said, most of those leaders would have their executive assistants book their accommodation and book all their transport uh, and, and so it would all be very foreign to them. Uh, and then I think it's around cities starting to actually uh, map out uh, not only what's already happening but understand the trajectory of what can happen uh, and map out some of the social, environmental and economic costs and benefits and, and start to look at that. Certainly some cities around the world have done some good policy work um, but I would also say that some cities around the world have done knee-jerk reactions. I think it's beholden on not just cities, but cities as a community to actually start to share some of this information. So this is critical what you're kind of pointing out, because we're in, uh, it feels like this window where there is a lot of, I would say, backlash mm -hmm. to the sharing economy that could result in some really bad regulation that mm. could do a lot of damage I think to this evolving but there is also models of good regulation so talk to me a little bit about where you see examples of both and and how do we start figuring that out and making sure we don't have some bad scenario we do we maximize for a good good outcome on this absolutely and I completely agree that there's a lot of knee-jerk reactions happening at the moment. Uh, and based on the conversation we've had uh, today, you can see that for me it's, it's not just about the individual companies and the individual issues, it's about making a decision about whether we want the share economy as a whole to flourish or, or whether we want to uh, actually control it so it withers and dies. Uh, and I think there's very little uh, argument that we would w really want the share economy um, you know, for societies around the world to flourish, you know, whether it's local markets or you know, um, you know, sharing of you know, um, local food in community gardens um, and sharing the local lawnmower or the local drill. There are so many different examples that it's not just about the current big companies. And so I think the big risk is that we, we we disempower communities to connect, and I think that that's the biggest risk. Um, in terms of, and could you just, can we just build on that one second? Sure. So, what is driving the negative reaction that you think is there legitimate concerns, or is it kind of 
disrupted industries that are behind it? Or how, how do yeah. you think about it? Basically? Uh, maybe I've got a slight grin on my face because as a, an Airbnb host, a high profile Airbnb host in my own city, uh, I had the local hotels association uh, at, at get up at, at last Christmas and make a speech, uh, the head of the, who, and then openly criticised me. Now, this is a, a gentleman who, and I don't want to be personal, owns multiple hotels uh, with multiple licences on, on poker machines, who has done financially very well for himself. Uh, and I was quoted in the newspaper as saying, this is you know, old Adelaide scared of losing their grip on making e easy money. Actually, I think I said digitally illiterate old Adelaide, mm. uh, scared of making their grip on, on, on easy money. And it is, it's just that uh, you know, the world has been defined in the last uh, 30 years by the baby boomer. Uh, the baby boomer has been very successful uh, at using the, the, the times uh, to create the right businesses and the right products, uh, which in turn has defined our society. Um, now, the next generation is coming through. Uh, they don't necessarily own a car. Uh, they're, they're internationally mobile. Um, they own a mobile phone. Uh, they use it uh, over, uh, to connect with everything and, and they use it to, to purchase. They move it to use it to travel. Uh, they use it to get a car. And this is challenging those people who want to continue to make lots of money in the traditional ways. Uh, and it's creating a whole new, um, almost invisible economy to those people who, who are not participating. And for them, they're seeing uh, their market share decline quite rapidly. And, and naturally, that's, that's scary. I'm not going to criticise them for being afraid of change. The human uh, body is designed to oppose change. That's the fight or flight. And the more things stay the same, the more they must be right. That's how the brain works. Uh, so, um, people who have become, you know, millionaires or billionaires doing things the way they've always done them uh, are now starting to be really challenged and we've seen it with Kodak, we've seen it with, you know, video stores, uh, we've seen it with blacksmiths uh, and this is inevitable but it's, it doesn't mean it's not scary. So, so there's, there's clearly the kind of disrupted industries pushing back mm. but there is is and then there's some kind of human nature that's kind of scared of change i guess you're identifying there mm. uh and then would you say maybe there's a legitimate piece there in, in your mind that that is truly any transition has kind of rough edges and you're trying yep. to figure it out and so, so there is something yeah. credible there and you're not just, saying it's nothing there's it's no just, problem there. honestly i'd just say it's normal um you know if you know i, I actually don't subscribe to the word disruptive industries uh, because all industry evolves uh, and so to not label it disruptive labels it in a negative way uh, and it's just new industry it's just innovation driving change uh, and that's normal I, I guess I go back to the fact that you know we used to have blacksmiths and now we don't uh, you know we used to have you know you know, people who you know, shod horses with you know, horseshoes uh, and, and a whole range of things. And that's, that's normal. It's just that you know, you know, we as human beings only ever apply our own understanding of society and we apply the last 20 years. But you know, 200 years ago, there was pretty much no job in existence that's in existence today. And to expect that that won't happen in another 50 years is, is to be naive. Yep. Uh, but uh, look, absolutely, I'd also say that the baby boomers, and I don't want to pick on them, uh, who have made the money, now can afford to lobby politicians to maintain the status quo and to protect their own interests. And that, that's, that's you know, eminently normal. And so that's a part of the process of you know, wanting to hand down their legacies to their next generation. Uh, but you know, I think you know, we, we, we really must, as a society, uh, always strive to evolve, always strive to be more efficient and more productive. And I think it's, you know, there's, there's nothing about the share economy that we shouldn't embrace, um, but also acknowledge that we need to iron out the, the crinkles and the, the issues to make sure that we get the best out of it uh, and it works the best for cities and society and our economy and our planet 
uh, and make sure that we, uh, uh, you know, avoid the pitfalls that you know previous industries uh, may not necessarily have done so efficiently. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the back question as we're kind of. Let's talk about the other side. The, cities that are really innovating, cities that are trying to do this right. Um, and you've traveled a lot, you've seen a lot going on here. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that strain of things and how that's happening and where you'd start to. So, so for example, if you're trying to wrap your head around it, where would you start looking? What, what's, what's happening yeah. that's good? What, are, what yeah. are the things that you like, like about what's happening? So I'm going to openly say I haven't done a global uh, search. Uh, and um, I'll, But I'm also not just going to say that I don't necessarily know the answer. I'm going to say that I don't think anyone has got the answer yet, hmm. which for me as an urban futurist is really exciting hmm. because this is pioneer territory. Uh, this is the great unknown. Uh, and, you know, whilst Airbnb as a company or Uber now are ingrained in the conversation of contemporary cities, you know, I'm here to say this is profoundly early days. And so we don't really know where this is going to go. Uh, and, I'm, you know, I'm privileged to be on the Mayor's Global Mayor's Advisory Committee for Airbnb to continue the discussion about what this really means and where is it going to go and, and what else can be mapped, uh, what other resources, what other creating communities can actually be, be mapped and how can companies work really well with cities. Um, in terms of best practice, I'd, I don't think there is a city in the world that would be doing, is doing the share economy as best practice. In mm -hmm. fact. I don't think there's a city in the world that really actually fully understands what the share economy can truly do. Mm -hmm. And just as Rachel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring mm -hmm. in the 1970s, and out of that we had a series of government departments in regional, federal and cities around the world become departments in the environment. We didn't see any before that. Maybe we're going to need to see government departments of the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. start to pop up. So I guess what I'm saying is that it is such early days that I don't think there is any city or community that has done it really well. There are companies that are doing it well, um, but the cities now need to work with those companies to help realise the potential of their own communities uh, moving forward. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not even going to go into the cities that are not doing it well because it's interesting. Um, it's also the fact that cities haven't really got their head around this yet. And I think what I would say is that whether it's town planning uh, as a whole, modern contemporary planning or governance, the first question always seems to be is how can we regulate this mm -hmm. rather than how can we help this blossom? Mm -hmm. And I think the communities around the world and the leaderships around the world that are saying, how can we map out our communities to help them realise their potential and our potential are the ones that are going to be the winners in this in this race uh, to be the great communities and great cities of the world. When you think about the window of opportunity here where we could either do this really badly or we could do this really well, what kind of p time period are we talking about here would, would you say in terms of if, if you can put a time sure, period on it. Absolutely. There's this obsession at the moment with a conversation around smart cities. Yeah. Uh, and I don't and everyone, every urbanist will sit here and tell you their definition of a smart city. Um, I, I'm I'm of the belief that we really should be having a conversation around the cognitive city uh, as we map these networks where every single person is a node and the vector is the networks between the, the digital networks, the common language of binary digits, speaking to every node, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then how um, algorithms and the artificial intelligence that is here today and will evolve will start to change those patterns. Uh, I think the question here is that within a very short space of time, maybe 15 years, a lot of this is going to become ubiquitous and uh, I think the race is over the next 10 to 15 years to make sure that we've set down the right values uh, and, and supported the right people to create the right networks, the right principles uh, and the right goals so that we can be empowered uh, as that technology empowers us 
uh, in the very near future to create uh, the opportunities that are present. And how optimistic are you that this is going to end well or how pessimistic are you that it might end badly? I'm just curious. Where oh. do you fall on your cut? If you had to make a call here. Well, you can tell I'm naturally optimistic. <laughs> and I think you, one must, if one wants to, you know, tackle climate change, tackle global poverty, uh, connect communities and empower uh, people, you've got to be optimistic because uh, I don't think being pessimistic helps anyone. Um, uh, that said, you know, we're seeing, you know, marching in the streets over, over Uber. We're seeing taxi drivers protest. Uh, we're seeing, you know, people, uh, you know, really concerned about a range of these things. But that's because the world is changing more rapidly than ever. Uh, and, and it is scary, especially, dare I say, for the baby boomers who now are in their 60, late 60s, uh, 70s, don't feel a part of this, feel quite threatened by it. Um, feel that a lot of the worth that they've created is now crumbling uh, and so that is quite scary for them. Uh, ultimately, I'm profoundly optimistic uh, because I do think that uh, the opportunities before us uh, will make our uh, cities, our states and our nations and the planet more livable, more sustainable and, 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 and ultimately more productive. Uh, and I think that's what we should be aspiring to uh, as, a, as, a, as a global community. Uh, and I think this is going to empower us to do that. We just need to bring our leadership along so they understand the real benefits and they can help it uh, flourish, not flounder. Well, that seems like a perfect place to end what has been a fascinating conversation with Stephen Yarwood here. In the sweltering heat of July here in Philadelphia around the Democratic National Convention. We are so glad you came in and had a little conversation with us about the future of cities. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.